And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, making his grand return after almost two years. Last last seen on the expanded material for Aether and Steamworks. Now coming up with a MOBA-inspired affair known as Legends Never Die, which n nice um nice setup with the dice there. <laughs> the you. one and only Tyson Burris. How are you doing today? Hello. Thank you for having me back on. I'm doing well. Excited for the next steps in in game dev as I have more time available to do with them. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be back. So, I'm not going to go through the origin story once, um, twice, <laughs> for <laughs> obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. So, instead, I would like to focus on what your introduction to MOBA-style um, games was. My introduction to MOBA-style games? Mm -hmm. uh, I played a, a little game called Warcraft 3, maybe people knew about that. <laughs> ah, so you got started uh, with Do you got started with the original Dota. With the original Dota, the original mod map. Um, I was spending a lot of time in college uh, between classes, sitting down at the library playing that game. That I had a zip drive that I would just plug into the computers, and then I would just run my game off of that. So I didn't have to have a PC, and we had some LAN member uh, parties and stuff that were going on, and, and played a lot of Dota uh, after beating the initial campaign of the game and looking for other other stuff to do. So I've been playing it since the OG days, since since MOBAs were a, a blink in an eye that are just starting to develop. Uh, and then from there, I went on to play some additional ones that had started coming out, Heroes of New Earth, uh, League of Legends. I started that from the beta. Same thing as uh, Dota 2, played that since the beta. Uh, did the whole uh, Blizzard stuff, Heroes of the Storm, uh, played a variety of, of different games and just tested them out, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, even that one we, we before the show you had mentioned Paragon. I actually did play that on my PlayStation uh, when when they gave it like on there to play. But I think I only ever got, got into like one or two matches. Yeah. So what pro what prompted the idea of t of taking the MOBA experience and trying to go TTRPG with it? Well, I'm always looking for new ideas, uh, honestly, and pulling from my own personal experiences and things that I enjoy. I've been looking around for a while. There had been a few situations where we had had some one-shots um, in my local community, because we have a streaming community online, where we had gotten into some PvP aspects. It's like, okay, so this we're going to play D&D. We're going to fight against each other at certain times, or we're going to play the other systems we were playing at the time, even Aether and Steamworks. And those didn't quite feel right from a perspective of players versus other players. Um, I also, in my community, have a lot of individuals who are very invested in the MOBA scene and some that play League and some that play other games. And I was like, well, how would everybody feel if we did like a League one shot at some point? We'll just try to do that. And then as always seems to happen with me, I start developing these things and then I start piecing them together and I'm like, you know what, this should be its own game uh, because it, it doesn't exist out there. At least I can't find things that, that match the way that I want them to. So I really wanted to focus on a system that was designed around the idea of playing against other players, having kind of chess style moves. I'm going to use my dashes. I'm going to use my shields. I'm going to use this ability to counteract that ability, uh, this kind of thing in a, in a way that would lend itself to these epic PVP battles that also are reminiscent of, of your regular TTRPG experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I will admit I have... I have dab I have dabbled in my fair share with with MOBAs. I did a ep I did an episode um, talking about MOBAs and he and um, more specifically hero shoot hero shooters and some some of the up some of the ups and downs with the genre at um, at the time. But when it comes to looking at the we're seeing a intersection between between MOBA and um, tabletop game, the pickings are very slim. There, there was the there was the clank board game which barely which barely counts. Mm -hmm. um, there was lane which was a which was a hack of the bolt engine. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And there and there was there was that there was that Bilgewater module, but along with a fi, along with a five E um, Runeterra campaign setting, but those are using five E. Yeah. So square peg in a round hole. Absolutely. And yeah, there was a there was a situation at one point too where um, I don't who was it? Uh, there was a community out there that played Warcraft uh, and made it. Uh, like a 3v3 scenario that's something that partially inspired that i can't remember who ran that oh, it was with like gosh anyway uh it's it's one of the bigger gaming communities that was out there and they were kind of hyping up world of warcraft at the time and then they created this scenario where they had people together and and then they both went up the mountain and they were trying to get something uh and and try to beat the other person or the other team to it and it became a, a thing but it was so slow so sluggish to watch because they used 5e and combat in that we can all agree takes forever sometimes um and it can go from i take my turn i swing i roll my one die to somebody else doing like six things at once and taking forever and (laughs) uh it it can really make that dynamic uh moment kind of break down Mm -hmm. and i'm hoping to avoid that with the way this system works yeah and th- that's, I think, I think, in a, I think, in a lot of cases, one of the f- one of the flaws that's ha- one of the flaws that's happened, aside from the folks who have tried to um, force it into a existing system, which mm-hmm. create which creates more problems than it solves, as as I brought up with um, with stuff like the Bilgewater mo- module and uh, Runeterra, mm-hmm. is. Is the is the fact that it's trying that a lot of people end up trying way too hard to replicate the three lane setup that you see in that you see in a MOBA, mm-hmm. which that's something that that's something that can be done, but I th- I think there's a degree of tunnel vision if you follow me. Well, well, if you, when you're doing that too, you are splitting the party. <laughs> uh, you're having to kind of switch between individuals that are doing whatever their lanes are supposed to be set up for. And I, I absolutely agree. That can create a, a tunnel vision. And that's not even getting into um, fo- folks who are use who um, who are jungling. Mm-hmm. C- completely by themselves, out mm-hmm. there doing something else. And this, even though even though MOBAs are team team games, there is a degree of um, of individual self sufficiency with them. Mm-hmm. Whereas the way cl- the way something like Five E is is bu- is built, there, unless you're playing specific characters, that's not the case. Um, yeah, they're uh, very dependent. Unless you're playing unless you're playing cow um cowzilla as we call it, <laughs> um, the cow being cleric or warlock. Yeah. Yeah, there's some definite uh, imbalances in the way that some of those might engage in a situation where some of them can be far more self-sufficient and some of them require a little bit of assistance in the way that their their build and their setup is designed to work Mm -hmm. so yeah and i'm guessing i'm guessing that um that early on early on the with the with the with the motif that you have that you have with let with legends never die um would it be fa- would it be fair of me to say to say that you had to spend a bu- you had to spend a bit of time nailing down how you were going to have dice work? Yeah, I had to kind of decide um, what way I wanted to go with dice. If you have just a, a single d twenty as an example, there's it's all based on a probability curve for sure, um, but it also limits how you can set up your game because then it's very reliant upon having. Uh, stat bases that you can bounce everything off of. If you have a d20, you have to have a plus and minus system in order to make that d20 work for the probability adjustments you're looking for. Um, If you're looking at uh, certain other types of of dice setup, then each one of those has kind of its its pros and cons. And I decided to go with a d6 success uh, system. So four, five, and six count as a success. Six is you get to re-roll and try for other ones. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, you have a 50% chance per die that you're rolling that you will have at least one success, and you can end up having exploding dice happen where you have more. And then you're trying to overcome either your opponent's rolls 
or uh, if you're playing against NPCs, which my game has a whole section for that as well, you can. You don't have to play this as a PvP game, but obviously it's it's kind of designed for that. Um, enemies have thresholds that you have to beat in order to succeed against them. So if you're facing off against minions or against jungle monsters or whatever it is, uh, if you're in the wilderness, you know, mm -hmm. uh, each one of those has a certain set of this is how you beat them. This is how many rolls you need to, to ca start causing damage, that kind of thing. So dice choice was very important for me in order to tell the right type of story, to have the right balancing happen. And so you weren't so reliant on, well, how do I get these pluses? How do I get these minuses? Mm -hmm. There are many games out there. Even even Aether and Seamworks uh, runs into the crux of when you're super high level. Okay, I have plus one here. I have plus two there. I have minus two here. I have plus three there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it can become, it can bog down a system so that it's slower especially when you're in like big large scale combat scenes or something. So avoiding that is just, here's your number, that means how many dice you have. Roll that, if you get your successes, count how many of those you have, play those against mm -hmm. your opponent's uh, defenses or special abilities or what have you, and that determines if you're if you're winning or losing, if you're causing damage or not. Yeah, that's that's the other thing that I, I noticed. Unless I'm mistaken, there is no static defense. No, no static defense uh, unless you're playing against NPCs. NPCs again, they have a uh, a threshold, which is like their static defense, as an example. But against other players, no, everything is rolled out. So there is a chance that you will, even if you have really high statistics, as an example, that your opponents can still overcome them and still cause damage to you, without necessarily having to set up, you know, combos or use special abilities or things like that. Mm -hmm. And now, now I I know that you I know that the document you sent me is technically speaking out of date, but mm -hmm. one of the things I was curious about is the not just the trinity of attacks, intellect, and skill shots, but also the plus minus setup that you have un that you have under each. Mm -hmm. So that is a way to keep track of your um, non-static, your your dynamic. Uh, changes to your character. Mm -hmm. uh, some of, some classes, like the, the healer, as an example, can give you a plus one, plus two, or plus three to your attacks. You can add that onto there, and then if you have negatives occur, you start taking away from those. Three being the highest you can add or, or reduce mm -hmm. uh, from either direction. And that, that still leaves you with a little bit more of a balanced system ultimately the highest you're ever going to have is a plus three and the lowest you're ever going to have is a minus three so they can cancel each other out and then you're just back to your regular st statistics um if you're sitting on a field that's full of you know a bunch of people that are fighting and a bunch of debuffs are being thrown around you don't want to have to keep track of 10 million of them mm -hmm. this way you can actually see it a bit easier on your sheet yeah and when it count now when it comes to the when it comes to the trinity that you have of attacks, intellect, and skill shots, mm -hmm. um, what sort of what? I'm guessing that with attacks that would be physical, intellect would be ma would be magic based, and skill and um, skill shots. It's it sounds like it's there for stuff that doesn't qu that isn't quite listed, mm -hmm. but more more of the more of the improv effect kind of things. Yeah, so as a as a character, your attacks is offensive direction. So there is a breakdown in the way I decided about these these capabilities, these statistics. They're called capabilities in this game. Um, that can be used for combat or out of combat if you decide to have a you know moments where you're role playing rather than just fighting each other. Mm -hmm. um, attacks are for aggressive actions. So if you're yelling at someone outside of combat, you would use an attack. Inside of combat, that's used for physical uh, actions. You're your ranger bow shots, your dagger strikes and sword swings and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, intellect is for your magical based attacks and abilities. Um, outside of combat, it's for figuring stuff out. Uh, and then skill shots are when you take a risk doing something that could have a big payout, whether you're you know, diving off a cliff to try to save someone by grabbing them at the last second, or whether you're firing off a special attack that has a small margin of, of success that might miss, but if it hits, is going to do a significant amount of damage. Mm -hmm. And in this, in the same vein, when it comes to the def when it comes to the defenses, mm -hmm. would they be would they would they be 
specifically stated in your class's abilities what that what they would be targeting, or is it or is it a case where you're choosing what what's what's being targeted? So defenses are for physical and non-magical attacks. Um, mobility is the second one, and that's for getting out of the way of magical attacks and skill shots. And then your stealth, if you happen to be in a situation where you can be unavoided or not noticed, you're unable to be attacked until you're out of that. So individuals that have high stealth, assassins and the like, can pretty much blend out of combat, wait for their moment to strike and come out, and, and not be party to being hit by anything other than potentially AoEs mm -hmm. if they're in the area. Now I'm guessing the resources of Dash's shields and and mana. The reason you have two rows of it is, for is again that static and dynamic setup that you mentioned with um, capabilities. Yes, because you can have more than your base, um, and you of course want to be able to keep track of these things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, dashes are used to help you avoid the successes that your opponents have on attacks or magic, or skill shots. Um, they reduce the amount of successes your opponent has because you're moving yourself out of the way. Shields reduce damage, typically. And these, there is, there's a multi-part to this, and we'll get to that mm -hmm. a little bit later. But shields in general just reduce the damage that you would be taking. In this game, you only have a total of five health. Mm -hmm. um, and a shield will block up to three health worth of damage uh, that you might take. Uh, those are, are very important, especially for tanky figures or for, to keep yourself out of harm's way or to have your game not end super quickly. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then mana is uh, the fundamental resource for some of your spells and abilities that you would have otherwise. Uh, every one of your abilities says what type of um, resource that it uses. Some abilities use dashes, some abilities use shields, and some abilities use mana. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to recovering it, is it is it a case of you recover between scenes or? Yeah, you, you do recover everything between scenes. So you get it all back, you're ready to get into fighting shape again and all that kind of stuff. There's no reason to require a huge amount of downtime in a game like this when you can just be like, all right, so you wander to the next area and you're ready to fight again. Um, but in combat, when you're engaged, uh, the only way to gain these back is through either special abilities potions or through the use of, uh, of of waiting on your action. So if you choose not to do anything at all, you can have one dash, one shield, or, or one mana. You get to choose which that you can return, but then at the same time, you're sacrificing action. Yeah. I'm, gu I'm guessing when it comes to encounters, you're not necessarily relying on um, on a grid approach. True. Um, so this is this is a a range approach. So the scenes should be developed dynamically by your game master, game master or announcer is what I call it in this one. Mm -hmm. um, but general terms, uh, enemies are either out of range, so they can't be reached by anything. They're at far range, they're at close range, or they're nearby. When mm -hmm. they're nearby each other, it means everybody's pretty much within arm's reach. Whereas close range is only a couple of steps will get you to that person. Um, so everything is kind of determined in this way. And while it might be helpful to use a grid just to to show, okay, well, that person moved out of range and they're out of range to these individuals and they're close to these ones, something like that. Mm -hmm. It can be played as simply as just being in one of those slotted positions and trying to retain those. And you can move between them like once around. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you use a dash, a dash can, can get you to one of those distances to try to stay out of harm's way or to engage on enemies. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. The... I think the big reason I asked on that front is I want is um whether or not is I wanted to make sure that there ha that there haven't been issues of people being too conservative with their resources. Uh, that has not been the case so far. Um, in our beta tests, we actually had individuals using resources pretty much every round uh, using potions and stuff. I've actually had to limit the amount of potions that can be used during a scene. Mm -hmm. Because people would go out and they'd buy like a hundred healing potions and they'd pop one every round. <laughs> um, so we had a couple of games that went on significantly longer to the point where we had to have multiple sessions because of uh, the way that they had been using their resources and the way that they protected themselves. And we had smart players. They were really good at bouncing back and forth against one another. So this is the equivalent of having like the one and a half hour to two hour <laughs> MOBA match and you don't 
I mean, it's fun, but at the same time, it's it's a it's a very long term thing. Yeah. So um, so that has been adjusted, and the resources are are very potent. And knowing when to use them and how to use them and how to balance them out is is kind of the key to victory in this. Mm -hmm. Knowing when to use your resources and knowing when to use your ultimate skill. Yeah. And speaking of that, I didn't. Is it a case where you where um you have all of your class abilities and your ultimate right out of the gate? You're not having to level up to get them. There is uh, options for that, so you can play where everybody just starts off with everything. I mean, it's up to you and the table to discern mm -hmm. to determine: are we going to be max level and we just try to fight each other with everything we have? But I do have a leveling system in the PDF I sent you. It's on page four. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in sidebar one. It tells you what leveling does. So it is designed to act similar to other MOBAs uh, in that you do have a leveling tree in place. Um, you can start off with all of your skills at zero except for one, which you have at rank one. Your ultimate is always available, uh, but can only be used sparingly. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some adjustments to that that will likely happen, basically conditions on when you can use your ultimate, and then you have to kind of set up those conditions before you can do it. Um, but those are being uh, adjusted as we speak. Mm-hmm. In the case of the leveling system, there's milestones. So if you defeat certain enemies, you'll start getting these milestones. Uh, once you've gotten to a sufficient uh, experience, basically you go up a level, you choose a new ability you want to increase. Sometimes you'll get stat or uh, resource bonuses, basically. And and then that's it. You can still only start with one ability if you want and then play and with your friends or what have you. And, and that allows you to, to have a longer term campaign. Uh, as opposed to a MOBA where you're gaining a level every you know, 10 minutes if you're playing at a tabletop. No matter what game you're playing, everything you do takes a bit longer than a video game does. So, um, so again, it's up to you and the table if you want to start where you can just jump right in and have all the abilities, just do everything right from the get-go. Or if you want to take your time with it and develop these characters and play them for a while and then have a big showdown or you know something like that. Mm -hmm. Now... In that same in that same vein, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to what was your what was your design motif when it came to the des the design of class abilities and um, ultimates? Because a lot of the ones that I saw that I saw, mm -hmm. um, unless unless there was some that I, unless there was some that I mistook. There's not a whole lot of damage focused ones. A lot of the class abilities are utility. Yeah. Um, damage, of course, is based on if you succeed on some sort of attack type thing, uh, you do a minimum of one damage. And then additional sex successes above and beyond what your opponent's defenses were, whatever they used to defend against you with, uh, are additional damage your opponent takes. And that can snowball very fast in this game. Mm -hmm. um, as, as the health starts to decline, each one of your steps in reduction in health gives you negatives that start to impact your ability to be capable. Um, so having a ton of really high impact uh, damage abilities felt like uh, it was an imbalancement. You want to be able to kind of adjust and take away from your opponent's resources and use your resources in a way rather than just focusing on, on the damage part of the game. That will come on its own. Uh, although there are there are a few classes out there that are very uh, damage heavy, and that's kind of their only focus. They have very low, very few other other resources that they can use, and that gives you the the ADC situation, the 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 mage that's in the background that you have to try to keep alive at all costs because they're going to nuke down your opponents while mm -hmm. they're all trying to, to kill that mage. You know, mm -hmm. um, that that sports vibe of the person carrying the ball that needs to get to the touchdown for everybody else. You got to do that in this sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in with that in mind, mm -hmm. I'm curious. I'm obviously there. Obviously, there's a heavy amount of of cl of class work in the document you sent you sent me. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if in the full book you plan on putting guides for how people could make their own. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I have a system in place for the way that I'm developing these. Mm -hmm. A certain amount of stats are are set up immediately for every single one of the classes that you're building. There's 21 points in total uh, between attacks, intellect, skill shots, defenses, mobility, stealth, dashes, shields, and mana mm -hmm. for every single one of these, and you can balance those out however that makes sense to you as you're developing uh, a class. And then the class abilities, there will be an entire section that says this is how you develop these 
for each one of these uh, classes and how their level ups should work. Yeah. Main reason I ask is because I wanted to see if we would if we would end up being in a powered by the apocalypse situation where you have to use the um, presented playbooks. <laughs> no, I hate that. <laughs> oh. I would love to see a community that goes in and takes this and then says, "Oh, I want to make my own uh, character from my favorite MOBA, whatever, or even from a different fictional universe, and then I can make them show up in this game and." And they have their own class and their own abilities, yeah. and then they're good to go. Um, I do. Rem I do remember at one. I do remember at one point because, um, as what as much of a Final Fantasy nerd as I, as I am, I remember um, trying to trying to make a Gunbreaker playbook, mm -hmm. uh, which worked. But the the problem was, I wanted a way to I wanted a way to make powder charges a core mechanic of it. Yeah, and some people got mad at me because I, because I was at because I was adding stuff when the whole when the whole point of PBTA is simplicity. To yeah. which I to which I said, yeah, the you're except except um most of the PBTA games that are, that have been out in the last few years, not not the first party stuff, the third party the third party material, which has kind of taken over. Mm -hmm. They're all doing their, they're all doing their own thing with the concept. Um, yeah. It's in the same vein as as why I I am not the biggest fan of um of of say a lot a lot of OSR games that ju that just play the um old school D&D parts straight but don't add anything to it. Yeah. Um I've mentioned this in the past my favorite one of my favorites is Adventure Conqueror King system which is using BX D and D, but it's putting a lot more emphasis on the end game motif. Mm -hmm. I.e., i.e., your your build your building up your hold your holding and followers at high levels. Yeah, oh. that's a definitely a different uh, direction that tends to be taken yeah, once cause... you get to high level than what you got when you're adventuring in the beginning, you know. Yeah, the the holding thing has bit has been there, but it's been undercooked. Yeah. <laughs> now there's a, it was an afterthought. It's like what happens at the end when they're already super powerful and rich. I do want I do want to, except um. The the counter the counter argument I've had when it comes to when it comes to that is that's when you shift from from blue collar crime to white collar crime. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess it could be seen that way. Because, or, or, or that's when you shift to the notion of you've been you've been invited you've been invited to this social to do that up until that beforehand you would have never been caught dead in, mm -hmm. and now you have to now you have to navigate a whole new den of snakes because of the politics of the whole thing. Yeah, playing a game for politics is significantly different than playing an adventure game or a save the world game or a deal with the villain and the bad guy game. Oh, you you can um, still do all, you can still do all that in both. It's it's more of this idea that once you, once you've gotten successful, quote unquote, that the story should end. I don't buy mm -hmm. that for a minute. Yeah, I I don't I don't believe that to be the case as well. I mean, there's still stories to be told there for sure. And I mean, some GMs just balk at the idea because they don't really know what to do with it after that point. And that's when a lot of them uh, turn your characters into NPCs and that exist in the world. And now they're, you know, ushering in the new steps that other adventures have to take. There's always been different um, different opinions on how that should be handled. I am I'm of the opinion that a lot of the peop a lot of the folks who are who argue about that aren't mm -hmm. aren't looking at the big aren't looking at the big picture because there there there's that tunnel vision about about think thinking what the right way to do it is. In reality yeah. the right way to do it is always going to vary between between tables so it's be so it's best to prevent present a variety of potential ways to do it instead. Mm -hmm. Now, speak. I'm guessing that I'm guessing that when it comes to the when it comes to the build a class ap approach that you have, there's 
there's not not a not a similar kind of point by approach, but a a series of example abilities that you that that you could that you could use for both basic and ultimate skills. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, in the in the name of putting this into practice, as I mentioned, I was going to do with with this before we even started this interview. Mm-hmm. I'd like to I'd like to list off a few names from from various MOBAs, and mm-hmm. see how you would interpret them. And if we need to go wiki diving, we can. Um, yeah. If given some of the ones we mentioned before. Before we went live with this, I don't think we will have to go wiki diving, but I'm still going to keep a list up just for my sanity because of the sheer amount of um, ca- characters involved. It's only hundreds. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's like that's like say, that's like saying uh, like saying getting hit, getting hit below the belt is ju- is just fine. You were wearing a cup. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, so. I'll go with a f- I'll go with a few from League first. Um, okay. First one I'd like to I'd like to use. In fact, I think I'm almost obligated to use because of my gimmick is Lee Sin. Yes. Lee Sin uh, was my main for a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, if we wanted to play Lee Sin in my game, as an example. Um, he would have dashes that or dash abilities that would allow him to move between allies and enemies. He would have a ranged attack that he could then. Uh, so there, so in my game, I have some characters that have just very direct. This is exactly what it does. I have other abilities that are while you're doing this, this happens. I have some that are passive abilities. Uh, like in the case of the changer, uh, you are that's that's a character that's kind of the concept based off of like Nar. Uh, where you build up your attacks, and then when you get to a certain point, you switch forms, you become some sort of big monster, your ch- your stats change, and so do your abilities. So having something that has uh, like alternate states, like an ability like Lee Sin has, where he can throw out a hit, cause damage to somebody, and that if he does cause that damage to somebody in this game, it would it, you could miss. So if you miss, you can't do the follow-up mm-hmm. where you launch yourself towards them and kick them in the head. Mm-hmm. Um, so you would have uh, th- those would be considered dashes because they also incorporate movement. And typically in my game, if you are moving at the same time as using an attack, and it's not like a teleportation, it's typically going to be a dash effect. So Lee Sin would have uh, pretty decent dash levels. He'd have skill shots uh, that are probably where he would be using those those ranged attacks to go and hit people. His shield would allow him to share some of that shield with an ally. Uh, so it's likely that it would if used just on himself, be more protective, but if used on an ally, both of them would gain a diminished effect of that shield. Um, he would have an attack that, that hit a small group of near targets, and if they were hit by that, it would slow them down, such as when he slams the ground with his palm and, and causes that very same effect to occur. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, his ultimate would be that he is able to just really wreck somebody's day and launch them. And if it hits anybody else that's in the way, uh, then they have to either get out of the way, again, it would be considered another skill shot, or they would be knocked up and temporarily stunned for a round, yep. uh, which could be very powerful. And just like in, in League when you're playing, if you can set up that skill shot perfectly, your whole team now has an advantage against the opposing team. Mm-hmm. So to shift, th- to shift things into something a bit more ranged, um, Twisted Fate... Twisted Fate. Ah, oh, I love Twisted Fate. Um, so, in relation to the classes I already have, I mean, if you wanted to say I kind of want to use somebody that already previously exists, uh, you could go with like the Archmage with him. You could go with the Blade Singer, and your cards are, you know, the the, the magical effect that you create. Mm-hmm. Or you could just make a class. Uh, any of those would work. But in the case of, of Twisted Fate, it would basically just be, you know, here's my, my AoE card attack that can potentially hit people as a skill shot. And you throw this out, and if they stay out of the way, they don't get hit by it. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd have uh, one ability that allows you to to kind of pick a card. You choose if you want to do something that stuns one person for one round, if it hits. Uh, I don't like the idea of 
automatically hitting people. You know, like in the game, you can kind of just click on someone, and if you're close enough, it just gets them. Mm-hmm. So everything does have a, a fail chance. Um, you could use it to give you back a resource. It, it, switching to a blue card doesn't necessarily even have to give back just mana, but you could be like, okay, I want a dash back. I want a shield back. Um, and alternatively, uh, beyond that, it's just either more damage or or maybe some sort of minor AoE type thing again. Uh, his teleportation effect, the ultimate skill. I already have many ultimates in the game where your character can just kind of appear in the group of people or closest to a target of your choice. So being able to just move from even out of range on top of, of targets suddenly and then make an attack would be uh, what his, his power would be, allowing him to either get the heck away from everybody and run or or pop in and, and then do some sort of like assassin type uh, attack that way. Mm-hmm. So um, you could use the previously existing classes and try to just make it fit uh, thematically, or you could go about, you know, creating your own and having it match up with that individual and, and having uh, a list of how these abilities might work or how they might be set up is again, beneficial in that way when you're playing with a book like this. Yeah. Um, what about Riven? <laughs> Riven. Oh, so I already have the bruiser in the game, which is more like a Darius or a Garen uh, with like an ultimate that, that executes. Um, a Riven would be more of a mobile fighter mm-hmm. that allows them something like between what I, the blade master is uh, one that I already have in the game. Um, that could be a Master Yi, it could be a Riven type. Mm-hmm. So they have Blade Rush, that is similar to Riven's ability to kind of jump onto our targets. Um, you could design this so that you have a couple of options. You could do multiple dashes every turn. You know, once once a turn, you could do a dash. And every time you dash, you also get another attack. And then you end on that final, final hit. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a Protective Barrier, is what the Blade Master has, that allows them to just kind of reduce damage and potentially heal. Of course, you could do the same thing with Riven, where you end up having that, that Protective Shield just stick with them. It's, it's a barrier that re- remains until it's removed. Mm-hmm. Um, you could, uh, the ultimate, of course, pretty easy to make something again that's similar to the, the Bruiser's attack, where it's kind of an execute. The lower health your enemy is, the more damage it causes. And it swings out in an AOE field, so it fires in a straight line, and anybody, it's, it would be considered a skill shot. Anybody that was hit by it would then suffer the consequences. Mm-hmm. Um, Riven is likely to be someone that would have a few more shields and a few less dashes than the Blade Master does, maybe a little higher defenses and slightly less mobility, um, and would be focused on both attacks and skill shots instead. So it would require an adjustment in the, the capabilities and the stats uh, breakdown for that particular character to uh, come to life. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd like to sh- I'd like to shift the next cu- the next couple instances to um, to some of the ones from Heroes of the Storm, mm-hmm. uh, which I am still so- I am still salty on how on how that turned out, but I don't but um, I have made it very clear that I can be very petty. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, now I I would. Part of me wants to be a smartass and say and and say the Lost Vikings, but that would requ- that would definitely require <laughs> some creative use, and you'd probably ha- you'd probably have to have multiple people have a gentleman's agreement that th- that they're working as one unit. Yeah, it would be it would have to be where the ultimate was switch your Viking, mm-hmm. and then each individual that you switch between would have their own small set of abilities. Um, it would require a little bit of creative writing in in the way my game is set up right now in the PDF in order to fit uh, like three lines of what their abilities do for each. And it's likely that because of the flexibility, the penalty would be that some of their abilities maybe aren't quite as strong as uh, someone who is primarily like a, a tank or a you know a damage dealer or or a support unit. Um, but it it could definitely be done. But just require a little bit of thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, but instead, you'd have to have like three pages. <laughs> That'd be the easiest way. It would be like three pages, and the power is switched to the next page, and then you just grab that character sheet mm-hmm. every time. But instead, what about Zeratul? Zeratul. Hmm. 
with his with his stasis bullshit. No, I'm not salty. <sighs> that one. Let me see. Let me look up his abilities again. I've only played with him a few times. So I already have the ability to uh, to switch your positions and to kind of the jump between targets. So we already have our stealth capabilities. So his his cloak would be something that basically uh, there'd be a passive ability that he has that is his cloak. And basically any time that he's not attacked during a round, he automatically gains stealth, which would suck. Uh, that would mean you could really kind of move into position and start fighting, and and your opponents would see that and want to rail in on that character, but that would reduce your other defenses, your other mobility. So similar to the way the assassins work in my game already, um, your stats, you wouldn't have the most defensive stats in the world, but that's because you're using the fact that you're not seen and it's harder to target you as as that being your, your main focus. Mm -hmm. And then in the course of, of something like his cleave, pretty easy anybody who's in a near range would get hit uh as an as an aoe um at the same time that you swung so if there's a group of individuals who are all fighting each other in a close combat you could jump in there and then throw this out and smack them all and then back off and try to try to go invisible again mm -hmm. um in the case of something like his singularity spike you could have an attack that is a skill shot that it hits and attaches and then you, it slows them down, and then you run away. And then after their next turn begins, then it explodes, which could actually be a, a really thoughtful. Remember I, how I said the game is kind of built around this whole uh, chess moves type situation. You have a limited amount of resources you can use per turn. So if you're throwing the spike on them, and now it's going to affect them on their next turn, that turn it's going to change the amount of resources that they can use, which then might impair them or might set up an ally to do something that takes them out. So that's kind of an intriguing idea, to be honest. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, blink teleporting in, in distance, that would be a dash, something that allows you to, to move somewhere without having to focus on stuff. It could potentially get you out of uh, getting hit by skill shots entirely, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, of course, you know, Oi, uh, his, his ultimates and stuff would really be a little more complicated uh <laughs> yeah but still it's it's possible there's definitely ways that all these could be handled mm -hmm. um and so, once again i once again i have to pander to my gimmick um karazim karazim <laughs> um let me look up karazim again i'm bad with names i have to i have to apologize for that mm -hmm. There we are. Karazim. Of course, a monk. Uh, it's me. It's you. <laughs> Just already out there. Um, so, he has an ability Radiant Dash, jump to an ally or enemy. Enemies are immediately hit with a basic attack. Uh, so, this would be a dash feature. I already have some in the game that do that, where you'll dash to a target and then immediately attack with what you have available. Mm -hmm. Um if you had this, you, it would allow you to use more than one dash on your turn, which normally you only get to use one. Um, so it would reduce your resources pretty rapidly, but allow you to bounce between targets and then do a quick, a quick and simple attack to them. Probably have a limit on the amount of damage that it could cause because we don't need someone jumping everywhere all over the field and destroying everyone all at once. But mm -hmm. um, there's that. And then, of course, there's heals. Heals in my game are actually very strong. Uh, when you have injuries, you will obviously have some negative aspects. Your, ca your capabilities start to come down. It becomes easier to snowball and, and lose uh, if you're injured too often. And heals will remove not only injuries and start to put you back towards normal, but that will return your capabilities. That will also um, make it so that, so that any debuffs that you're under will typically be removed. So in the case of his ability to heal people, I mean, that would be a very effective uh, ability. And then maybe give them, uh, in the case of like his ability, Breath of Heaven, it would give them an immediate dash or an immediate movement uh, so that they could, they could kind of get out of harm's way or get into an engaging spot if they're having a hard time reaching somebody, like a lockdown who is keeping them from ever getting anywhere near anybody. Mm -hmm. um, now, things like attack speed... Like in the case of Deadly Reach, uh, I would say that what that would give you is one basic attack, one extra basic attack per round, uh, and maybe increase the accuracy of it uh, over level ups as you go through that. So 
a basic attack is just your roll attack. So you don't have an ability attached to it or anything like that. Um, and typically, you have to choose between using your abilities or making a basic attack or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So having the ability to throw out an ability and then punch, follow-up punch, would be pretty potent. And having increased accuracy on it means you're more likely to cause damage. Yeah. Um, in the case of an ultimate, such as, like, uh, the seven-sided strike or the divine palm, uh, you would really have to... Having a choice of ultimate skill would be something that I would I would potentially consider putting into this. There are a few out there that say do this or do this. Um, but again, you have to reach a requirement in order to actually use the ultimate. Let's say you were to set that up, uh, seven-sided strike, you would just kind of bounce between nearby targets and get the chance to attack them once, uh, once at a time. And during that turn, you can't be injured. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the end of that, you're done with it. You don't have the ability anymore. You can't use it again. Yeah. Uh, in the case of like Divine Palm, you could use that to really keep somebody from protected from death uh, and then returning a large amount of health if they go down uh, for like a turn or two. So if you have someone who's being heavily targeted or focused on, it would act kind of like a, uh, a guardian angel from League of Legends, where as soon as they drop, they get back up and they still have some health and now they can do something else. And that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, shifting into... Uh, smite. Mm -hmm. uh, and what once? How would? And I'm I'm mainly bringing him up because he because he's been he's been one of my favorite ones for the longest time. Um, Guan Yu. Guan Yu. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Guan Yu. This is one I haven't played. I haven't played this character before. Let's see. His courageous leadership is infectious and will focus heals himself and his allies. Healing friendly gods reduces all cooldowns. So it's just that would be a healer, a healing uh, ability. Maybe a mi minor AOE healing gives back one health, something like that. You'd have a choice on, on how that would work. Typically, if you do something AOE wise, it should always have a lower effect than doing something to a single target. Um, uh, let's see. Slowing enemies is part of the game, so in the case of Warrior's Will, where he launches himself forward, this would be a dash that moves uh, into position, makes an attack towards enemies that are that are in that route. Uh, they would be slowed. Uh, in my game, I believe it's actually called slowed. Let me see. Facts. Now I'm trying to remember the uh, name of my own abilities, but basically slowed in my game is you can't use your regular movement. Uh, without using your main action at the same time on your turns. And uh, dashes are the, basically the only way to continue moving around. So it really holds you in place, and you have to either have that debuff removed by healing or by a potion or by wearing off over time. Um, but finding yourself slowed means you can't reach the casters in the back, you can't chase down people as easily. and it's, mm -hmm. you, you become kited, basically. Yeah. So, in the case of the Talu Assault, um, this would be this would be a triggered effect where, like, for two rounds, anybody that is within a nearby range would have to defend against the attack. And if they're hit, then they they get they get hit. And uh, if they have a buff on them, then your character would steal one of those buffs. It's now it's now yours. So if your opponent he has healer has given. Uh, a stat increase, a capability increase, you mm -hmm. would suddenly have that instead. <laughs> that could be very strong. Yeah. It's likely, again, that it would be a lower amount of damage, maybe only one, but stealing people's buffs can significantly change and alter you know, the outcome of a, of a match. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of cavalry charge, this would allow you to move more than one distance. Uh, typically, you can only go between out of range to far range or far range to close range or close range to nearby uh, in, in a turn. So if you are, say, two distances away, you could caval cavalry charge into that distance. You could get a lot farther. And uh, while you're in that, that charge for that round, you can't be locked down into place. You can't be frozen or slowed or anything like that. And then you hit, if you hit targets, this would be a skill shot. They would be injured and, and slowed themselves so they can't get away from you. Yeah. So that's... You know how you could do that with him. In in this game, um, it appears that 
It has uh, a passive ability, in this case, uh, the Painless. Every time he takes damage or deals damage against stacks, mm -hmm. everything becomes boosted at that point. This would be the ultimate. So uh, in the case of Guan Yu here, every time you were successful against an opponent, you would gain a stack. Once it reached a certain amount, then everything else would increase in the amount of damage it caused and the amount of turns things slowed and the amount of distance you could move with like cavalry charge, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, one th one thing that I should have asked earlier was on was on the nature of AOE. Is it a case where it where it's going where it attacks everybody within that particular range band, or is there a different approach? So it does uh, hit people within certain ranges. So if you have a, a far range AOE um, that can reach a, a target in far range, you choose a specific target, and then anyone that is uh, within near range to that person to that target is now part of the AOE effect. Um, I don't currently have any abilities that are larger than one distance range away. So if you're firing at a close target or you're, you're at a close target to you, it's not going to hit everybody that's close. It's only going to hit people that are nearby. Um, so you have to already be kind of engaged and close uh, in close quarters with multiple individuals to, to use that effectively that way. Mm -hmm. So... Now, with that, with all that in mind, I think the other thing I'd have to ask is regarding, um, regarding we regarding weapons, since obviously the, um, cla the classes that were listed in and it didn't specify the type of weapons that are that are going to be used in the type of ranges. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's going to be customizable, or or in the full book, are are there is it going to be something that is, um, set? So the way that this game is designed, uh, theme is important um, for those that are that are looking. I mean, you could play it with just saying, oh, this is the ability I use and I just attack this person. You don't have to be descriptive. But many of us that are in the TTRPG field or that have gained kind of like a, uh, an interest in our characters are going to want to say, okay, well, my theme is uh, Rainbow Magic Unicorn Girl, and I'm going to be using my wand to do my attacks. Um, so when it comes to equipment, that is up to the interpretation of the player to determine what you're carrying on you, you know, what you're attacking with, that kind of thing. But uh, the growth of those things and the importance of, of what you have comes from enchantments, equipment enchantments. Mm -hmm. So you could say my character has a Musashi blade, a katana that I've had to fight demons for, and suddenly I'm blah, blah, blah. That doesn't make anything more than just the thematic approach of the character and how you're going to describe their actions and how they attack. But then you can say, well, my my blade also has um, the tri-power uh, enchantment on it. So when I use an ability, my first attack is going to be enhanced. Uh, or it has the life-stealing capability on it. Or it's it's got a beast slayer enchantment on it. And each one of these enchantments has three levels um, that, that you can kind of increase the potency of those as well um again through through a gold system in game or if you want to just start off with these super powerful things and just fight each other with the most powerful version of yourself that you have you can do that as well mm -hmm. i intend on having more equipment enchantments right now i've got uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven so i've got 12 of them right now that emulate some of the items that you would get in your typical mobas and I've got consumables, uh, potions from health to mana to special abilities to that kind of stuff. But I intend on fleshing that out and having another page worth pretty much of each one of those things so you can kind of pick and choose through them. But the um, the whole, this is, this is a TTRPG thing, of course, but we, we, we like our items, we like our, our legendary artifacts we find, we like our upgrades, a treasure, things like that, if you're going to be playing a game that's longer term rather than just something that's that's PvP-based. And the way you would do that as a, as a game master is, is you describe something that's already probably thematically appropriate for your ally, for your player that's in there. It's like, oh, well, I know you have the Musashi Blade, but you happen to have fought this enemy and you found a treasure and hidden inside of an ornate box. You open it up and you find inside of there a blade made of pure meteorite that is also a katana. And what you would do is say, well, this has these these two or these three enchantments on it. That's what makes it special. So now that you have that, while you're using it, you're using it with those enchantments. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, 
what are you shooting for as far as a page count with the full thing? Are you think are you thinking no bigger than one fifty or more? Um. So when I have fully completed this right now, I'm at forty five pages. So I'm I'm thinking that a hundred pages is what I'm actually shooting for for this this particular thing. Um. It'll have sections again related to classes, and I might have more classes that are made available even through my my Kickstarter um, uh, rewards. Individuals who pay at the fifty dollar tier will actually get a piece of custom art. They'll design what they want their character to look like, and I will turn that into uh, a class in the game and give them a signed piece of art for that, mm -hmm. which is a good deal. I mean, fifty dollars for a piece of art you get to have and use however you want is is cool, right? Yeah. Um, and it, so those could be additional pages. Each each class is a page on its own. So if I end up having all of those rewards purchased out, which I doubt, but if it, if it were to happen, um, I think that's 20, 20 extra pages right there I'd need to be writing. Um, and beyond that, I also want to increase the, the equipment. I want to provide uh, details about uh, how the economy might work if you were to turn this into more of a campaign-based game rather than just a MOBA-based game, which, again, that's it depends on what you're looking for when you're playing this game, if you want to do it MOBA-style, if you want to if you want to have something that you and your friends just come in and it's like, okay, I'm going to play these these champions. Here are your abilities. Here we go. We're ready to go. Let's just put them on the table and we'll fight each other, and this will be a, a two- or three-hour event this evening. Um, or if you want to say, hey, well, let's let's tell an epic story that is in Runeterra and that spans you know, a few hundred years or something, or whatever it is that you decide and is all about finding the world runes and dealing with other characters that we know about. Mm. Um, so having a section that'll that'll say how the economy works, how much it might, you know, what your average cost should be for doing certain things, why the gold works the way that it does, and how you could collect it alternatively. Right now I've just got it set up so that if you kill certain difficulty levels of enemies, you find a, an amount of wealth upon them that you can use for anything that you're doing. Which, you know, maybe everything in this world has some sort of value. Pull its teeth out. That's two gold. Who knows? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so having that, having uh, the character creation section, everything like that, it's probably going to be between like 100 and 150 uh, pages in total. Yeah. And I will certainly look forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to the show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> of course. Thank you for having me again. Mm -hmm. And if and um, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>